Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we're going to talk about orchid species versus orchid hybrids. What are the differences between them and similarities? What does it actually mean for us as home growers mostly? And also, why do some people seem to prefer one group over the other? And to be fairly honest, I like both of them. I don't know why we need to put down one of the groups just to enhance the other when, in my opinion, one is an amazing feat of natural evolution, while the other is an amazing feat of genetic engineering. Both of them are wonderful, but they do have very different purposes, let's say, in my opinion. So let's talk about explaining what each group is in case you're new to the orchid hobby. Let's start with the orchid species. Some nurseries will also call them botanical orchids. These are the orchids that have been discovered by humans in nature as they are. And then they haven't really been tempered with when it comes to genetics. All of these, which come from reputable nurseries, have not been collected from the wild. They have been propagated in cultivation, through seeds or tissue culture, even through cloning by obtaining keikis, and so on and so forth. And there is some degree of selection, but it's very minimal. We typically chose the variety of these species, which tend to be either more robust in our home conditions, either have a better feature, like a better flower, better fragrance, so on and so forth. You might already know that some species do have multiple forms or varieties. For example, the Violacea. You can have the pink, the bluish one, the magenta one, even though those orchids are not hybrids, they are selected varieties, let's say, of the same species. So there is some sort of human input, but it's really minimal in comparison to hybrids. So even though these orchids have been propagated in cultivation, they have not been crossed together with other orchids to obtain something you would not find in nature. This Rincolalia glauca orchid looks identical to the one you would find in its natural habitat. Now, hybrids are the result of humans crossing together species to obtain something totally new. You would not find something like this in nature. And on the market, there are multiple types of hybrids available. We talked about this before, but I'll mention it again very, very briefly. You can have one species crossed with another species and you would obtain a primary hybrid. But then you can have that hybrid crossed together with another species or another hybrid to create a complex hybrid. The degree of complexity can vary quite a lot depending on how many species or hybrids have been crossed together. Also, you can have multiple genera which are compatible crossed together. You can have one genus of orchid crossed with another genus and you would obtain an intergeneric hybrid. One of those intergeneric hybrids is the Epicatlia Rene Marquez flamethrower which we saw yesterday. Now, why humans felt the need to hybridize these orchids, to cross them together, to create something which nature would never do, probably? Well, it's hard to tell, but I guess that, like with every technological or botanical discoveries, it's a blend of a need with a curiosity. Humans are naturally curious and are naturally prone to do experiments, to try things out. We all try things out in our orchid collections, right? Well, imagine this at a much, much higher level. So with that said, let's talk about the features of the species and the hybrids because they all have the so-called pros and cons. They all have their soft spots, but also their strong spots and figure out what makes them so different and what we actually need to understand about each of the groups. So first, let's start with the species. For all intents and purposes, these orchids are absolutely perfect. Not necessarily for us, but for the place they actually thrive in, in nature. Through millions of years of evolution and natural selection, all that we have left now are the individuals which are the most adapted to the conditions they live in. And these adaptations range from resistance to disease and pests, and also to aesthetics, how the flowers look like, how they smell, how the orchid behaves, how it reproduces, and so on and so forth. Depending where they're coming from, the species can have a set of very unique features which make them appealing to only some group of pollinators or make them adapted to a very specific type of growth. And if we just think about the epiphytic orchids, some of them can be quite unruly, pendulous. If you think about growing this orchid in a home, I think you can see how it can pose a few difficulties when it comes to our display capabilities. But when it comes to nature, something like this is perfectly adapted to grow on a tree branch or the tree trunk, just 
grow downwards and support its weight efficiently through anchoring itself on the tree. The Angraica markets have taken everything one step further. Their flowers have a very, very long nectarine, which only benefits one group of moths with a very, very long proboscis. I think this is how you call it. Therefore, they've adapted to attract only that pollinator. They have a very specific fragrance, which is released only in the nighttime. They don't have very, very colorful flowers. They're typically white or pale green. It's not necessarily something very appealing to humans, particularly because we're not nocturnal. And also, we tend to like bright, fleshy colors, but in nature, things are a little bit different. So as you can see, the perfect world of the orchid species is not always so, so perfect to us. And the more we look into the orchid species, the more we can see how they perfectly adapted to the pollinators, to where they live, the climate, the altitude, and even to the other plants that surround them. Some terrestrial orchids have adapted to produce very, very long flower spikes simply because in their environment, grass is pretty tall. Also, thinking about the Bulbophyllum orchids, you might already know that some have a very foul smell. Well, that's because they're trying to attract flies instead of bees, butterflies, or moths. Some orchid species really cannot handle life in a home because they can come from such different environments that they can be very uncomfortable for humans. For example, the cloud forest orchids, such as the Mastovalias, the Draculas, and Odontoglossums. In those conditions with very high humidity and cool air, not many people are super comfortable. And I'm not saying about the conditions outside, but inside the home. The problem is, when these orchids are introduced to our home conditions, they will not thrive. So they need us to create special conditions for them in a separate room, a greenhouse, a grow room, or a room or a corner in our home which is totally different from all the other rooms in which we live in. So at this point, I think it's easier to understand why we wanted to create an orchid which resembles the species, but has a different environmental need. Something closer to what humans would like. Being that they went through so, so many years of selection, typically species have a very, very stable gene pool. You remember how yesterday we talked about that Phalaenopsis which decided to be pyloric? Well, with species, that doesn't really happen. Whatever imperfections came along the way, well, sadly, nature had a good way of disposing of it. Let's put it like that. If it didn't work with the environment, with the pollinators, with everything, that orchid didn't pass on its genes. In cultivation, this doesn't really happen, and usually the weirder an orchid looks like, the more we like it. But with species generally, it is more unlikely to have these unexpected behaviors and phenomenon. Now, aesthetics are not the only things which are more stable, but behavior as well. If you know me, you know that I sometimes say that I do not trust the complex hybrid Phalaenopsis orchids and I tend to control what they're gonna do next, when I'm gonna cut the flower spike, when I'm gonna let them grow vegetatively and so on and so forth. Well, this is because their gene pool is a little bit too mixed at this point to make the proper, let's call them, decisions for their life. Their so-called survival instinct, it might be a little bit off balance and they might be more prone to bloom themselves too much or create too many cakeys and so on and so forth simply because their gene pool is way too complex, some genes are not compatible with the others. Well, with species, this doesn't happen all that much. There is a degree of variability with species as well, again, because we tend to multiply them in cultivation and we don't go through the ongoing natural selection process. We go through the human process, which favors aesthetics, um, but generally, you will not have as many unexpected and unforeseen events with orchid species like you have with the hybrids, because they just don't have this contradictory gene pool. Sometimes the species can prove to be rather more difficult to grow because we are trying to acclimate them to an environment which might not be very appropriate for what they want. And the species do have such set set of requirements that many of the times it can prove to be rather difficult to make a species thrive rather than a hybrid. Of course, there are many species which can thrive in a home because the conditions are very similar to what they would find in nature, but if you just think about the Moltoniopsis, the Mastovalias, even the Odontoglossums, it's easy to see how some house conditions will prove to be quite inadequate for them, and they will not be as forgiving and as flexible as the hybrids. 
Also, some species might have features that we absolutely do not like, we don't want in the same home or in the same room with us. For example, the Bulbophyllums. Some of them have such foul fragrances or odors, should I say, and so strong that you cannot simply have this orchid in your home. And even though the orchid is beautiful and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, it's not really our cup of tea if we don't have a separate room for it or a greenhouse. So hybridization actually tried to make this feature disappear with some hybrids and in some cases it has done so successfully. However though, if you happen to live in the same location as some orchid species, it's easy to see how you can grow them beautifully and successfully in your own backyard. With the hybrids, maybe this will not happen because again, their gene pool is very, very mixed and you don't know if the genes which made the orchid, let's say, resistant to heat were still passed on to the hybrid. So under some conditions, you will actually have much more success with the species that you already know can handle your environment. As for the hybrids, well, it's a fact that they actually look more diverse. Imagine getting all of those wonderful species which are already looking amazing and get something that looks like nothing you've ever seen before. As I was saying, humans tend to prefer aesthetics over everything else, which led to a multitude of hybrids all looking absolutely amazing, colors which you would not normally find in nature, the black orchid, that's the result of hybridization, it's the result of somebody being an absolute genius and just having a little bit of luck. All the hybrids you see on the market nowadays are the result of humans tempering with the species. And all is well and there are many, many positives about hybrids, but there are also some negatives. Nothing comes without cons. As I was saying, humans tend to prefer looks over pretty much everything else. And with better looks, let's say for us, came some unwanted features, such as very unstable genes. And again, we saw yesterday's video with that Phalaenopsis, which just decided to be pyloric because why not? Also in the case of some Cattleya hybrids, such as this one, we perfected the wonderful color, but we left out the fragrance. And as you all know, the complex Phalaenopsis orchids, which you can find in flower shops, most of them have absolutely no fragrance at all even though many of the species in their parentage do have fragrance. But with the hybridization process and making efflorescences showier, bigger, more luscious, we missed out on some features. Fragrance is just one of them, but it can actually go deeper than that. Even though we managed to create never before seen flowers, the genes of these orchids are not always getting along with each other. So let's imagine we're combining an orchid which creates one single very big flower with an orchid which creates tiny little flowers in big numbers. The hybrid can try to create multiple very large flowers which will not all develop because the orchid simply doesn't have enough energy. It's not big enough to sustain that amount of flowers and of course the size. And this happens a lot with Phalaenopsis and not only with other orchids as well, case in which with these orchids we can experience quite a lot of butt blast and quite a lot of unusual behaviors. Now it isn't all bad though, because except from the looks, many hybridizers try to obtain more vigorous plants, ones which will grow a lot better in home conditions than their species ancestors. And this is how the house pet Phalaenopsis was born. And not only her, the Paphiopetalum, Cattleya, Dendrobiums as well, which do absolutely fantastic in a home, even though their species might not be so vigorous. Because what good are looks if you cannot keep the orchid alive, right? So humans did try to work a little bit on this vigorousness as well. And it's not unusual to find that some hybrids tend to grow faster, better and just thrive in our very inappropriate home. It's not the case with all of them, but with many, many of them, it really is. And in many cases, these hybrids actually do better in the house than if you would put them in your garden. Vigorousness is not the only outcome of hybridization. You can have improved resistance to pest or disease. This is a very sensitive subject, I would say, because we all know that we do have orchids which are very, very finicky, quite sensitive to disturbance, which just look wonderful and we must have them, but there are those hybrids which just seem indestructible. And maybe it just depends on the hybridizer or what you manage to obtain. I do believe that all hybridizers try to keep in mind vigorousness and resistance, 
but when it comes to aesthetics, you get a black orchid, you have to clone it, no matter if it is more prone to disease. You will try to improve the trait over the years, but if sensitiveness is the price for a black orchid, I'm willing to pay it and give it a go, are you? However though, I do want to end this video on a note, which I always mention in my videos when I'm talking about species, but I want to repeat it whenever I have the chance. It is of the utmost importance to preserve the species in nature. It is not okay to take orchids from the wild. If you don't really care about the morality of things, think about the fines and the possible imprisonment you might have to go through if you take an orchid from the wild. We have a lot of species in cultivation and reputable nurseries never sell orchids obtained from the wild. If we keep taking these orchids, one day we're gonna wake up to no orchids in the wild. At the end of the day, none of this would be possible without the species. The hybrids would not exist without the base or the core genetic information. And no matter how many hybrids and how many discoveries we'll make, we need the species. And not only the species in cultivation, but the species in nature. So on that note and on that bombshell, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Hope you've enjoyed our little discussion here. And you know the drill, like or dislike this video below. Subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos, tutorials, Q and A's and other fun orchid subjects. And if you like YouTube to notify you whenever I upload a new video, just turn on notifications for my channel. Also, if you're curious about my setup and what I use in my growth space, just check the description. I list everything there. And with that said, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.